good to be back. It was a little strange pulling in here tonight after being out so long. But it's good to be back. We are in Hebrews chapter 9. If you want to go ahead and turn there. The plan is to get down through verse 10. And then Nathan is going to be picking up there on Sunday in verse 11. And I'm not exactly sure. He may get through the end of the chapter, but we'll see how far he's able to get. But let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for all that you give to us. We're thankful for this place that has been purified and sanctified by the precious blood of your Son. Father, we're thankful for this means that we can come to you through his high priesthood and know that we are heard and that you will give us help in our time of need. Father, bless us in this church. Help us to love each other, to serve you, to have joy in our service, to be people that are ones that are positive and encouraging and that are thankful for all that you have done for us and that we can do for one another. Help us to love you in your, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In your son's name, amen. All right, so we're here in chapter 9, and we're in, the, in this section, really, that's describing the sacrifice and covenant. So it's been a little while since I've been here. Thank you, Byron, for, for covering under such short notice. But uh, we're in this section on the sacrifice and covenant, and one of the things that we've been talking about is about how the new covenant is so much better. And there's a few phrases that have been highlighting this throughout the section, and we'll continue to see that as we go into chapter 9. But if you look back at chapter 7 here in verse 11, in 7 and verse 11, he mentioned that perfection, if it was attainable through the Levitical priesthood, then why would we have another priesthood? So there's a flaw, there's a reason that there is a or a need that is there. In verses 18 and 19, he, po- he talked about the former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. Then you look at chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. You have a, a weaker priesthood because the priests were prevented by death from serving, and he's contrasting that. And then we had in chapter 8 and verse 7, it says, for if that first covenant had been, felt, had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. And so we have just this repeated kind of uh, emphasis throughout this section. And then now we're going to really zero in on the tabernacle and particularly the covenant and how that whole covenant was set up and the, um, the means and the superiority of the covenant that we have now. So with that being said, we're going to look at chapter 9 here, verses 1 through 10, and we're going to be focusing again the contrast of covenants is what I've called this section. But there is one thing that I want us to be aware of as we go through this section. I mentioned this, and I didn't realize that you were going to be the one that taught this, (laughs) I thought maybe Nathan would. But this one here particularly is where I wanted us to see the the distinction the Hebrew writer has in his mind of earth and heaven, and that that juxtaposition, in a sense, the contrast between what's on earth and what's in heaven, and how we need to wrap our minds around what the tabernacle was, why it was important, and what it symbolizes, and then now to understand what we really have in Jesus and to fully appreciate that. Because I don't know how it is for you, but you know, <laughs> we don't have people running around in robes usually. We don't have some you know, guarded space where if I go in there, I'll be killed. Uh, the closest thing we have is maybe government buildings or something like that, that you have to have credentials or something. This can be a little confusing, but it's extremely important. Because if we don't understand this Old Testament concept, we're not really going to appreciate what we have now. So with that being said... Just look at the concept of heaven and earth, and you'll see that juxtaposition or that contrast, and then we're going to look here at the Old Testament. So, who would like to read for us here verses 1 down through verse 10, and then we'll jump in observation. Go ahead. <laughs> Of the 
All right, thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into this section. Again, much of this is just tied to the Old Testament tabernacle, and I'll, I'll have an image here for us to look at that here in just a second. But let's go through and do our observation here. So what's words or phrases that jump out to you? And try to, uh, and I'll try to repeat those back for those that, of course, we've still got a lot of people out sick. So um, what stands out to you? A tent was prepared. Okay. What else? Yeah, unintentional sins. I think one version rendered it like sins of ignorance. Because remember in the Old Testament, the way that this is described is um, sins of weakness. But then you had where it was flagrant, you already knew, and there wasn't any, any covering for that. There was specific consequences that were, uh, were dealt out for that. What else? Yeah, holy place and most holy place, which again, that's, that's going to be important for us because holy, the idea can be kind of, I don't know, just sort of strange. We don't use that in everyday vocabulary, but it is an important concept. What else? Yeah, earthly sanctuary or sanctuary. Yeah, that goes to, again, it points to that distinction that I was uh, talking a little bit about, where you have something on earth that is representing or connected to something in heaven. What else? Once a year. Once a year. Good. Once a year. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how y'all did that, but y'all said almost the exact same thing. <laughs> Not able to perfect the conscience, so I don't, I don't know. So, uh, what else? Not without taking blood. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, again, it just seems like in Western culture. I mean, when's the last time you saw blood outside of maybe yours or a kid's blood? Very rare. I mean, we don't kill our own animals. That's done off at the processing plant a long way away. Just a really strange uh, concept for us, and yet for them, it was a part of everyday life. So, um, what else? Okay, regulations. Good. What else? As you're thinking about it, one thing you will probably notice is just how rapid fire this section is. I mean, he just goes whoosh, just real descriptions. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm assuming you've already read the Old Testament. You know what these things are and, and, uh, and the descriptions. And particularly, notice as well, this is not the temple. Even though the temple might have had some of these, it is verse 2, it is a tent that was prepared. It is specifically referring to the tabernacle, and we see part of that just because of Aaron's staff that, that budded, so, and the urn with the manna as well. What else? Okay, cannot now speak in detail. Um, if we have enough time, at least one of my goals in class, is for us actually to be able to spend a little bit of time I thought it'd be a fun time to just kind of, what do you think all this means? So that's why we're going a little less. What else? Uh, 
Okay, I was looking through it. Usually what I try to do with this is make sure, you know, has everybody hit everything? And so, time of reformation at the end of verse 10, and then I like the parenthetical, at least that's how it is in the ESV, which is symbolic for the present age. So you've got a past age referred to that is way until a time of reformation, and then he's talking about something that's symbolic uh, for a present age. So you've got you've got some of these distinctions here that we're going to have to have to work through regarding time. Okay. So anything else? What else is there? Any other one that's burning um, that you you want to jump in and put in there as observation on it? Okay. Well, just for sake of clarity, I want us to. I've got. I'm going to skip ahead here for just a second. We'll come back. Um, this is one diagram of the tabernacle itself. And again, a lot of this we probably already know if you've read the Old Testament. Uh, perhaps you have, maybe you haven't. But there's a lot of different pieces here. So uh, this might be a little strange to look at. It's going to the left. So this is where you would enter here. But here's the outer courtyard. Here's the holy place. And here's the Holy of Holies. And then you had distinctions, right? You had various people that could enter into the various places. You had Levites, um, or you had priests that could enter here. And then you had only the high priest that could enter here with the Holy of Holies. And then these are the various pieces that you've got the veil here. You've got the altar, uh, the menorah. You have the Let's see, is that what he calls it? Lampstand. And then the table of showbread. Then you've got the door coming in, the labor, the altar for the burnt offerings, and those kind of things. So that's what he's referring to the various pieces um, here in this first section. So let's walk through the, uh, the flow of thought. Do you all want me to keep this up, or do you all, everybody, I just wanted everybody to see it. Go ahead. Hmm. Right. Yeah, I use the word door, but when we think door, we're thinking like a knob and turning it. That's not the idea. It would have been overlaid uh, fabric, sheep or uh, animal skins, that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that had the same basic layout, and the opening was always east. Yeah, yeah, that's important. I don't have the directions on there, but that is, that's another element of it. Anything else you want to say about this chart before we go and kind of step back? I just want to make sure everyone's clear on where everything is. It's just good to go back and refer to these things. So let's go back here, and let's talk about interpretation then for a second. So... Let's just analyze the the flow of thought. In the first five verses or so, basically he's talking about the regulations and earthly place of holiness, and he's just describing the details and all the pieces that went into that. And then he's talking about the the service of the priest for that particular building in verses six down through verse ten. So that's kind of the ideas of how they're connected. But um, why is this so important, though? Why is it critical for him to refer to these ideas, or why is he referring to these ideas? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it lays out all the details and then talking about all of the things that the priests have to do go through just to have one one day, one little piece of it. And that's going to be in contrast, stark contrast to what we have in Jesus. Go ahead, what were you gonna say? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. So considering those those old aspects, kind of working through every bit of that, and then saying now compare that to what we presently have. So that's that's um, that's good. Go ahead. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so he's just kind of reworking through the copy and and showing how these things are shadows of that and just reminding them of those elements. I'm trying to summarize. So y'all got to shorten your comments a little bit. Y'all are going, <laughs> there's a lot of people trying to summarize for it. <laughs> but no, that's that's important because we just kind of ran over that. Or it's easy. I didn't say we run over. I'm not saying we necessarily ran over it. But whenever we look at this section back in chapter 8 where he mentions they serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, it's easy to just kind of be like, oh, of course. But that's what all of the Old Testament was. Even the city of Jerusalem is a copy and shadow of the heavenly city. That's the whole idea. And the priesthood and all of those elements uh, are there. And so the tabernacle, um, you know, I don't know everything that went into you know Moses and all that kind of thing, but when he says in verse this is in chapter 8 there in verse 5. See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. I'm sure there was instruction about that, but I wonder what he saw to form a pattern off of it. And so, uh, again, there's a lot, of, a lot of elements there that um, are helping us to kind of just see and appreciate uh, what, all was in, what all was involved in that. So, what else? What else do you think, as you go through this section... Maybe there's a question, or maybe there's um, some kind of idea that it seems kind of strange, or maybe you're not you're not clear on kind of going through it. Go ahead. I was uh, I guess you'd say the holy place uh, is symbolic for the seven days. <laughs> so I that see it's when you look at that that concept symbolic for the present age. It's easy to think he's saying, oh, it's just the holy place. But I think what he's saying, it's, it's the entire thing. The whole picture of the tabernacle. It symbolized the picture of the problem, the present condition. And it helps remind Israel that you are my people, and you have my presence, but there, there's more. So, go ahead. I think that's at least a possibility. Um, so this, again, when we look at back in what chapter 8 says about it being copies and shadows of the heavenly things, this goes back to the way the biblical authors think about heaven and earth. Okay, And we need to kind of wrap our minds around that to really appreciate what's going on with the tabernacle. So initially... When you look at the garden, was there any division between God and man, between heaven and earth? There's, there's not. I mean, obviously man is on earth, but God can come and there's fellowship and all of those ideas. And even when you look at the, uh, the tabernacle, let me go back to this for a second. When you look at these divisions here, okay, when God makes the entire earth, it's good and then he dwells in it, right? He comes and he settles. But then, whenever you look at the Garden of Eden, it's a closer spot. It's a unique creation for man specifically to dwell, and for God, and God obviously dwells with him there. So when we look at this, yes, these are shadows, obviously, of the heavenly things, but they're also pictures of what was missing and what was lacking in Eden. And 
we'll kind of talk about some more of that hopefully here in just a minute. But when you look then at what the present condition of our world is, think about it's, um, it's just like this tabernacle, is that if this is the presence of God, who gets to go in there? You can't just walk in there. There's a veil. There's a division. And that is pictured where, you know, here's earth in a sense. And then this line right here coming into in His presence, that's heaven. There's a division between it. And that's why when you look at these concepts of the veil throughout this, and the veil being removed and all of that kind of idea, and the, sim- the symbolism of the veil being rent, it's that now you have this access that has been granted uh, to where, you know, a man has gone to heaven, and then there's this ability back and forth of um, you know communication and that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Is that is that clear? Is that there's a, a pathway that's been opened? Questions, thoughts? Have y'all thought about it that way? Because <laughs> the reason that's important is because just think about this this concept at the end in Revelation. What is it like? Is there a veil anymore? There's no veil. There's no division between us and God, is the picture. And so what he's describing, going back to chapter 6, is that we have this hope, and it's really within a person, that has entered, this is at the end of verse 19, a hope that enters into the inner place, which again, he's talking about the real inner place, which is heaven, behind the curtain. Well, what's the curtain? The curtain is the present creation. It's, it's what we see. It's the division there between heaven and earth. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that go to... I don't know that that may be... Right. Yeah, so let me let me dig into a little bit of that. So the division here is present not just because of the separation between them, but the division came because of sin. And that is obviously what the, the priesthood concept, all of that uh, ties into. But this goes to what he's describing there in uh, verse 9, with this being this uh, the symbolism, and this is in chapter 9 and verse 9, and then also the concept of chapter 8 and verse 5. These are shadows of the heavenly things. When you look at what's happening with the temple, the whole idea is this is what's giving you access to God in your present, your present um, division. What's on earth? He's in heaven. How do I get there? It's through this. It's through this process. And so, again, it's not just about, oh, the tabernacle is important. It's that there's a real reality that is, um, that is present, where these are just shadows. These are just figures to help us understand the true reality that is the division between us and God that is present because of sin. And that's why he's saying, yes, he has gone beyond the veil. He is in heaven presently. And then there's this veil concept of, we can't see that, right? There's a division between us and God. Go ahead. Sure. Signifying, yeah, it's similar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you can. I see what you're pointing at. So why would you want the symbol of giving us access to God 
when you can have the true reality of access to God in the person of Jesus. That's, that's his concept. That's the, the difference here. And again, any Hebrew that really understands that concept, they would say, well, I would never do that. <laughs> why, why would I want the, the shadow or the symbol instead of the true reality of what God has secured for us through Jesus? Um, there's, there's some things in here, so what else? Questions, comments, is that clear? I know it was kind of like a, there was a little bit of ruffled brows, like, what is he saying? <laughs> I don't know if I explained that very well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the means. It's the best they had at the time. So it's great to have the tabernacle and this whole process, but once you have true access granted, why would you then go back? Which is, again, part of what they're doing here. And that, uh, again, is just showing this contrast because you can't really, you can't have two, or at least <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to have two when you have something that's better that's been secured through Jesus, the real access there. Um, what else? Things you want to add or got questions on in that section? Because when you look at what he's describing here with the priests, they go regularly into the first section. This is just what they do all the time. Then they go into the second, only the high priest, not without taking blood. He offers it for himself and for the sins of the people. And so, again, by this, verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. Again, what, that's the point of the Old, Old Testament tabernacle, is to say, there's a problem. <laughs> there's a fundamental issue that is here because of sin in the garden. It's going back to that initial issue. And yet now, because of what Christ has done, this is the time of Reformation. There is access. We do have a high priest. We do have that uh, relationship um, that was lost all the way back there. Okay. Right. Yeah, it couldn't perfect the conscience. And that's going to be his main argument going forward, is how our consciences have been cleansed. How? By the blood of Christ. And because we have the clean conscience, because our sins have been removed, we now have access. We have that as, um, as the means then, um, even though you have still this distinction um, between you know, where he is and where we are presently. That's not going to always be that way. And he's already gone there. Okay, what else? I think we've gone through most of the interpretation on that. <laughs> but it's, a, it's an important concept. Do you see that? Because it's, it, it helps us to understand, and, it, and maybe this goes more to application, but it helps us a little bit here to look at our world and say, okay, you believe in God, but how come you can't really see Him? Or you believe Jesus is there, but why can't you, why can't I go there? <laughs> I mean, why can't we pack up and say, hey, let's go to heaven, let's go see Jesus and verify. There's a problem. And it's the veil. The veil is there. It's present still there. Does that mean Jesus isn't there? No, He's there. He's already gone ahead. And that's the hope then that He kind of tie into for the Hebrews here, that why would you throw that away? You, have, you had no other way to get there. Even on the Old Testament system, the best you had was just a shadow of it to make you aware of the reality, and it didn't ever take it away. So uh, again, it's just kind of helping us to kind of wrap our minds around that concept. Questions, comments? 
So one thing I want us to do before we get into application, though, is I want us to give us five minutes or so. I want us to talk about the symbolism of each of these pieces a little bit. Because God doesn't just like pull things out of a hat, right? Just say, hey, let's just have, you know, these ideas. Uh, what do these different pieces in the tabernacle represent? So let's talk about the lampstand. What does the lampstand represent? Okay, the light of the world. Okay, good. What else? Do we know of any other holy places in Scripture where there was something that looked like a big tree? Here's the tree. What is the candle? I mean, we think about the light, and the light is part of it. Why does it have the branches that go out? It's a tree that's right there in the holy place, in the presence of God, which again is just a, it's another reminder of the kind of things that of the kind of things that are lost. Okay, what about the bread of the presence? I mean, it's not like God's over there eating the bread. So, <laughs> what's this bread about? Why why is this so important? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, that's that's a communion, an eating element. We think of eating as kind of a strange deal, but that was something there before the curse. I mean, it was something that was given, and it's talked about as something that will be enjoyed in the kingdom. Um, I mean, look at a couple of these other things here. I mean, what about the altar here? What does that symbolize? I mean, how are you going to get here? What do you need? You better come with a sacrifice, otherwise you're going to get struck down like Nadab and Abihu. It's not going to work. So this is pointing straight forward all the way to Jesus. You have to have the sacrifice of an animal. Okay, what about this? What about the leather? Yeah, they had to wash themselves before they went into it. It wasn't just go kill the animal. You kill the animal, you wash yourself, then you entered. What if you entered without washing? And not going to work. And again, these are just they're things to help us understand why is baptism important? Well, God's always been talking about the cleansing properties of water. Why is blood important? It's always been about the sacrifice that allows you to enter uh, into that. Um, we talked some about the, the lampstand and the showbread. What about the incense? The incense here. What is that? Okay, communication. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's a lot here. Hopefully, just kind of scratching the surface of this will cause you to go back and read the book of Leviticus <laughs> and kind of think through all of this. But for one example, uh, in the true heavenly temple, Revelation talks about this, that the prayers uh, are the incense. And the, it is the prayers of the saints that is that incense that is thrown down to the earth in judgment. It is God having the, your prayers. You ever wonder if God hears your prayers? There it is, right there. There's the symbol. It's right there in His holy place. He hears your prayers, and He responds with them. It's those kind of pictures that you need to see. These aren't just kind of out of nowhere. They're important. Go ahead. It's not it Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you I'm glad you dug that out. Uh, there's there's other things here. And even the uh let's let's talk about a couple of these. All right, with the uh the ark, okay? 
what is woven on the fabric all the way around and is placed on both sides of the ark? So it's the cute little babies with wings, right? That's, that's cherubim, right? No, it's these enormous beasts that are, that are pictured as guarding holy places. Where was the la- where's the first time you see a cherubim in the Bible? Outside of the garden. Why is it there? To keep you out, okay? Yeah, every bit of this, all the way through it. And it's remember, it's all gold. There's flowers everywhere. You just had this sermon. I mean, you just talked about this in the Lord's Supper talk, right? Uh, but I mean, you've got a couple of these same things with the manna. What is the manna? Uh, I love the description from the Old Testament is that this is the bread of the angels, <laughs> which is kind of a weird description, but it's a heavenly bread that's coming down to provide for man. What does it mean that Aaron's, Aaron's uh, staff, I mean, the tablets of the covenant are obvious, but Aaron's staff, one thing that's interesting about that, did you notice that on Aaron's staff, it flowers, it, bu- it buds, flowers, and sets fruit all on the same staff? That's on a dead limb. That sounds strange, doesn't it? Except, unless you read in the Old Testament, guess what the tree of life, well, like or in the New Testament, what does the tree of life do with its fruit? How often does it set it? Every month. Ever seen a tree that does that? Nope. Because that's the abundance of what? The garden, right? Here's all of God's holy place, and here's the specific place of us being with Him. It's a reminder, again. You know, he didn't have the... uh, to go into all the detail, and you can go back and dig at it, and you're probably thinking, ah, he's full of it. He doesn't... (laughs) He doesn't, you know, he's not, uh, he's not right. And then maybe there's some of this that we can kind of work through, but these aren't just kind of haphazard things that the scripture has preserved for us. They're important and they're images. And then, I mean, if we can see the images as well of the priests who can only go in there once a year on the day of atonement with blood and cleansing, like we see the intentionality there. The rest of this is very intentional as well. All right. So let's talk about applications then. We've got just a few minutes to talk through that. What are some of the applications that you think come out of this, just kind of looking through this section? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it would be extremely hard as a Jew or even as Christians if we don't know the Old Testament, it's going to be hard to see this. And so, again, I mean, <laughs> I've talked about this a little bit with Byron, though. You kind of have this expression, we're New Testament Christians, right? And we kind of throw off the Old Testament. Like, ain't wrong. Like, that's not understanding how we are to approach the Old Testament. Yes, there's shadows. Yes, there's symbols. But they're meant to teach us to guide us to understand what we really appreciate and have uh, in Jesus. And yeah, how much God has done, how, how everything that fits into that. And let, let's, let me give you a, another example that I think, again, is, is important here. What about the holiness of God? Do you see that? I mean, in our world, we think, oh, flip it, I'll just pray to God whenever I want to. You know, it doesn't really matter. Maybe He hears me, maybe He doesn't. We're just kind of real flippant about it. And yet, holiness is pictured as something that's very good. It's something we're supposed to be, He wants us to share in. We'll see that at the end of chapter 12. But it is not something that you and I presently possess. And if we enter into the presence of His holiness in our present state, I mean, we're gone. But, not only that, notice what this entire section is about. What does God want from you? <laughs> what, is, what does He want? Why, why the whole tabernacle? Why the whole rig and roll of getting this all set up? What does He want from you? And what should we want with Him? A relationship. God has gone through so much so that you could have access And again, the whole thing here we should be seeing is, yes, the holiness of God 
is terrible in the sense of, you know, it, it's not terrible in the sense of it's a bad thing, it's so good. But it's that we should look at that and desire it and want to enter. We want to go into that place. And one of the, uh, the things, though, is just in this show, we... <laughs> Well, we don't really get it, is we do what Jeroboam does a lot of times. We just think, oh, priesthood, psh, who cares? We don't care about you know, all of these images and sets up you know, the way God has it. You want to be a priest? Come on down. I don't care what tribe you're from. We can do this however we want to. We'll just walk into God, God's presence. And again, all of that is just to completely misunderstand the point of all of this particular section uh, in the Old Testament. All right, what else? What are, there, what are other applications that you see here from this section? One thing, I think, not just the section, but the, the whole thought, like, through your history, interesting. We talk a lot about Hebrews, so I feel like that is, you know, everything in Christ is better than so much better than better. And obviously words like superior and, and that is mm-hmm. what you're making. But I think uh, overarching that is what you're getting at is becoming a Christian and following Christ is the most Jewish thing that you can do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, using, you are even using Judaism to be Christ because this is what all of this is. Like yeah. It is the fulfillment of Judaism. Yeah, exactly. It's and for those who are listening in, it's being a Christian is the most Jewish thing you can do. It is the completion of Judaism, and that's why it's such a tragedy. Some of the conversations we talk about when people say, "Oh, you know," they look down on the Jews, or they're just like, "Oh, whatever." The Jews, you know, they totally missed it, or they just want to throw off the entire Old Testament. It's just, it's not a fair representation. <laughs> it's just not a fair representation of what the Bible is really saying uh, about the importance of, um, of our heritage. What else? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to appreciate the seriousness of sin. And then, because we appreciate the seriousness of sin, now we can appreciate the seriousness of what, what Jesus has done. Remember, we've, we kind of went through this. What is the fundamental problem in Scripture all the way through it? It's sin. It's that God is good and we are not. And we think of that as just, oh, it's not really that big of a deal. It's the division between heaven and earth. It is the dividing factor. There's no way. It didn't matter how many times you build up a great tower, how many great achievements you have, how good of a life, how many, you know, how much you offer to the poor. Does not matter. It will not take care of that. And so one, then if I understand that concept, I should hate it with every fiber of my being. I should turn away from it. And yet we're very flippant about it. I mean, oh, everybody sins. It's not a big deal. And yet, again, it's just a totally different idea. And then on the other side, to realize, verse, uh, this goes down here to verse 9. These things, arrangements, gifts, sacrifices offered, they cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. It cannot. And we live with the guilt of our sin all of the time. But then we come, and we're, you know, Nathan will talk about this next time, is that, and this goes to verse 14. The one, the blood of Christ, who offered himself without blemish to God, will purify your conscience. It does. It brings that relief. And again, it's not because you're so great. You ever wonder if you measure up and if God really loves you and if you deserve to be saved? You don't. That's the answer. He, what he has secured, he has granted us the privilege and the ability to then enter into his presence. And that's why it's so critical that we appeal to that over and over. Okay. A lot more to talk about here. We'll stop right there, and we'll pick up in uh, verse 11. Nathan will be teaching class on Sunday, and we'll see how far he gets. You can bombard him with all your questions. So. <laughs>